Yeah, this is what trivia night's going to be like, too. <laughs> Just we'll put a question up on, on screen. I'll shush anyone. It's quiet. Actually, that is, a, that is an excellent point. Trivia night uh, tomorrow night should be a lot of fun. Uh, also, the Lullabot Party at Handlebar tonight at 7. And uh, Sprints on Saturday. There's still a whole lot of Drupal, a whole lot of DrupalCon left to go. So much Drupals. Okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you. There's a, there's a seat up front for anyone who wants to actually be within throwing range of me. <laughs> so, the battle for the body field. This is in no way an incendiary title or anything. Um, anyone who has participated in the Drupal universe for more than a short period of time um, is probably familiar with arguments about WYSIWYG editing. Has anybody ever run into an argument about whether to use one, whether we should have one standard built into Drupal, whether you should turn them off and just teach people to use markup so they, don't, so they aren't lazy, um, we should just make them magically better, we should figure out how to embed Dreamweaver in a text area, <laughs> anything in between those spectrums. I mean, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's overextending to say that this has been a contentious topic in our community. Um, and it's actually come to the forefront in the past couple of years because we actually are going to ship with a really high quality WYSIWYG editor in Drupal 8. This is fantastic. So it won't even be something that you have to go and dig up because your client told you absolutely you have to or you know someone in your company said, by God, we can't figure out how to make bulleted lists or something like that. It's just going to ship with Drupal 8. So it's cool on some levels, but it's also reignited a lot of heated debates about what the right way to use a WYSIWYG editor is, whether people should have them at all, whether they're an abomination that should be cleansed from the earth, whatever. Thus, Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Um, I, I think one of the problems is that we've been having entirely entirely mistaken arguments about this. We've been fighting about the wrong things for quite a few years. We've talked about it as a conflict between like ugly, crappy markup that we think WYSIWYG editors generate versus clean markup. We're talking about like, um, you know, this, it, 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 looking at it as a tug of war between lazy content editors who don't want to learn HTML and markup literacy and understanding the tools of the web. You know, maybe that's the real conflict we're looking at. Maybe the answer is Markdown. The answer is not Markdown. <laughs> it is not. We will get to that later. I love Markdown. I edit, I, I do all kinds of stuff with it. But the answer to this particular problem we're going to be talking about is not Markdown. And maybe the answer is easy versus hard. We just have to get, accept that certain kinds of things that you know, people need to do in, in working on the web and in creating content will just have to be hard. And they're going to have to learn that. It's not a simple versus easy, a few things versus a lot of things. It's, that's a lot of these subjects that we argue about are missing the point. I love that effect. So for anybody who is interested in just leaving after five minutes and going and getting a beer, this is basically the rundown. There are four really important things that we often miss when we fixate on WYSIWYG editors as the heart of this problem. One, is anybody familiar with the idea of blobs of content versus chunks of content? Okay, the chunks versus blobs thing goes around in the content strategy community a lot. It was coined by Karen McGrain in her book, Content Strategy for Mobile. But it's the idea of we, we break things up into lots of individual fields so they can be remixed and repurposed and, you know, shifted around in different layouts and stuff like that. And that's cool. But the problem is, is just treating it as a battle between big blobs of HTML and wonderful tidy little chunks that we can reshuffle is insufficient to solve a lot of the complex content problems that we have. It's an improvement, but it doesn't go all the way. The other issue is that HTML in and of itself is insufficient to represent most of the content that people are creating on the web. It's sufficient to represent how it looks in a browser, but not the meaning of the content itself. There's a vocabulary mismatch between the two. And we'll get to, the, get to what exactly that means later. The third point is that 
there are communities that have been tackling these weird, tangly problems of what to do with semi-structured stuff, things that are, you know, they have long narrative flows and they need to be editorially controlled and written by a human being, but they also have little pockets in, of structure that need meaning and need to be at particular places. That's the kind of problem that the XML community and people in communities like the DITA, uh, anybody here use DITA? I'm sorry, you rock. Um, no, I mean, the, the, they've been tackling and, and chewing on the hard problems about semi-structured content for a long time. And there's tons of lessons we can learn from them. And then the real concrete takeaway in the Drupal community that we can really, really learn is that we need to, need to stick to storing meaning rather than complex markup structures and then transform them on display into the kind of structures that we want for representational purposes. And again, we're going to go into the details of what exactly that means, how it plays out, and great tools that can make that easier. But that's the gist of it. If you have any significant disagreements with any of these things, you can, in fact, throw things at me, mostly if you're in the front, because I don't want you to hit anybody. But go for it. Um, this, is a, this is a core conversation, so it's hopefully a little more raucous. Wow, everybody is so cool. Oh, I see. Got it, Larry. That's Larry. We know how this is going to go. Um, I agree. <coughs> so the really, really hard problem that we are familiar with, that I think our community and a lot of other web publishing communities have learned is the hard problem and figured out solutions to, is that for many, many years, this is how we made web pages. A web page was a file on disk and a URL that was accessed by a web browser and a piece of content, and it was handcrafted by artisanal web monkeys in a copy of <laughs> BB Edit or Ultra Edit, whatever you used, and you, you sweat bullets. And, you know, I th Morton, I think, you know, comes from the school of you, you create pure, wonderful markup, and then you separate the presentation from that with CSS. It's great. And this is actually an incredibly flexible, incredibly powerful way to create a piece of HTML content. The problem is, in the real world, what usually ends up happening <laughs> is a WYSIWYG editor gets thrown on top of that because not everyone is like an HTML artisan who wants to craft some sort of wonderful you know, piece of HTML art. And this is what people end up editing documents in. Um, <laughs> And that is actually Comic Sans, and it is blinking. And that is, I am told, although I am red, green, colorblind, I'm told that is magenta. <laughs> that is what we often encounter, and anybody who's done a large-scale migration on an existing site, either where they had lots of handcrafted HTML files they had to migrate into a CMS, or where just a WYSIWYG editor has been turned on and all the buttons were available, <laughs> you get monstrous stuff. You get pages that look exactly like somebody wanted them to at the very moment they were created. But the problem is, is all of that crap that's being, being built, A, breaks the minute anything changes in the design. That's assuming that the people with that direct markup control are very scrupulous and always make sure that their work perfectly matches the design standards and the design guide for the website. Because that, that's what everyone with a WYSIWYG editor does, right? <laughs> you know, they look up the brand guidelines and they make sure they've got the right styles. And, you know, if there's anything that they, they don't see any guidelines for, they go to whoever designed the website and they make sure it'll fit in well. Yeah. But then, even, if that, even assuming that best case scenario, the minute the site gets redesigned, all of that markup that they put in there is just dumb, raw markup that has to go back in, be edited, be updated, even assuming that you have the regular expression guru, you know, ultra genius, that's still a huge amount of work to do on any site. The other one is that content reuse suffers massively. 
In Drupal, we, I think we practice tons of content reuse without even really thinking about it in the way that like the larger content strategy community works. The ability to create a piece of content, show its title in a sidebar list of links, show a teaser for it on another listing page, show a full version, have different permutations of that piece of content being displayed in different ways in different places, and to edit one single piece of content and have all of those things reflect those changes, that's content reuse at its basic form. Now, that doesn't even account for things like going and repurposing that content on other websites, pushing it out to other platforms via you know, feeds like RSS and stuff like that. But once all of that stuff gets baked into the content, the body field, um, reuse suffers massively because it doesn't fit with other designs. It may you know, break other websites, all kinds of nasty stuff. And then finally, this is one has been a really, really big issue over the past couple of years as everyone and their dog gets a mobile phone that has a web browser and everyone starts using it instead of all their other computers or whatever. That kind of design, the handcrafted artisanal web design jammed into a WYSIWYG editor or whatever, that tends to break mobile browsers or tablet browsers, or telephone browsers, or Google Glass, or whatever random crap people decide they're going to want to access content from. At this point, that's not even a, an annoying edge case. The number of users who are using mobile phones primarily, or even exclusively, is rising steadily over time especially if you're in um, an organization that really cares about accessibility or there are legal requirements about how your content can be accessed. This is a huge, huge issue. And that's really the heart of it. This idea of an HTML page that we design and we create and throw out there to the wind, it breaks in all those scenarios. We've come up with awesome solutions to this in the web CMS world and especially in the Drupal world. Fe field API, views. We have all of these tools that have been present in our community for years that have made a better approach, uh, a chunkier approach. Uh, create little blocks and put them together and make your piece of content out of a title and a subject line and all that kind of stuff. This is a huge improvement. It's, I mean, for people who remember being the webmaster of a web page or the home page for your company or something like that, you, you remember how awful it was doing very simple edits to the site. And the kind of chunky, field-based approach that we use, taking individual pieces of a type of content, piping it through templates to handle all of the crafty, you know, the crufty markup that wraps those individual bits of content, that's a big shift. We've replaced this with wonderful things like this. Does that make everyone's heart just swell with joy? awesome. It's fantastic. It's enabled so many cool things. And in the Drupal world, we even have a really mature, rich API that you can drop new types of fields, new ways of remixing them, stuff like that. The problem, and there is still a problem with this, is that as much as we try to chunk things up, and as wonderful, wonderful of a job as we do, we still end up with these nasty, crappy little mini blobs embedded inside of our wonderful chunky content models, which is where the body field lives, in one of those miniature blobs inside of the wonderful, idyllic, platonic, chunky content. <laughs> and that's why turning on the WYSIWYG, <laughs> yes, I, I need a chorus. Um, and that's why turning on the WYSIWYG editor in the body field is one of those incredibly common things. Because as much as we want to tease out all the individual stuff, the body field is where all kinds of things, unpredictable things, stuff that we can't really figure out what it's going to be until somebody tries to jam it in there, that's the kind of stuff that lives in there. And uh, that's my worst case scenario. Um, I didn't introduce myself. I'm, I'm Jeff Eaton. I work for a company called Lullabot. We do lots of large content websites. Uh, Martha Stewart, MSNBC, MTV UK back in the day. You know, like sites that have, you know, WWE for uh, people who like uh, men throwing each other around. Um, who doesn't? Indeed. Who doesn't? Um, 
One of the most common use cases we run into is, yay, hooray, chunky content, field, stuff like that. But um, I really need to put these three photos in a gallery right here in the article. It can't be in the sidebar. It can't be, you know, automatically just stuck in near the top of the page or something like that. No, it's I've written an article. And at this point in the narrative flow of that article, I really need this thing to live there. <sighs> I, I, I tremble to think how much human energy has been lost trying to argue editorial teams and content creators out of that very simple need. Now, do you really need it? I'll bet, I'll bet if we just always put it after the third paragraph, that would be fine, right? No. It turns out, no, as much as we can, just, we can push back and we can negotiate, that is a really, really, really common kind of problem. And it's not exclusive to photo galleries in news articles. It occurs all over the place. This is the harder problem. Although chunking things up and using templates to reshuffle and remix individual little pieces of content, utilizing structured content in that way, that's given us huge, huge gains. But this remains. The first element of this really tangly, difficult problem is narrative text. I don't necessarily mean like storytelling. I mean some flow of text in which a human being's like narrative energy, their creative telling of some sort of, you know, piece of information is important. It's not simply being assembled out of individual little bits. This is like a conversation or a sales pitch or a piece of news, tell, you know, taking somebody through like, you know, the inverted pyramid, stuff like that. Something that a person is writing. Um, a common, common cases that we end up seeing are like long, long reports. Like there are, you know, a lot of federal agencies. They publish their content on the web and they have huge reports that are basically a single long narrative document with all these pieces, whether it's complex figures and charts or data tables or pull quotes and statistics and stuff like that, littered liberally throughout the flow of the document. You can break it up into chapters. You could, if you were really debauched, you could try to break it up into pages, like, you know, traditional, you know, like pages of a report or something like that. But you'd still be left with the fact that there are islands of structure inside of that big flow of narrative. And the placement of those little islands of structure really, really matters. You could get away with putting them all in you know, footnotes, depending on how you're presenting it. But it matters that you know, the reference to it, at least, lives at a very specific place. I, I, I don't want to beat this horse too badly, but like, these three things, if you've only got two of these problems, any two of them, you can usually get around the real nastiness of it. But if you've got all three of these things at once, you're kind of screwed. This is an example of a page from msnbc.com. I keep flogging that because it's a site that we just launched. We're happy to talk about it, stuff like that. Um, and this is a wonderful example of the problem like in its simplest form. This is a picture of Pope Francis. There's a little description of the photograph. There's credits for the photograph listing who took the photo. Um, in some cases, there's also a title at the top of the photo. Sometimes there aren't credits. Sometimes there's a link off to another story that the photo came from or something like that. This is an island of structure. It's got maybe four or five different little elements. It has to go at that particular place in the story. Mm, yeah, I tried arguing with them about whether it really had to go there or not, but it turned out it had to. Um, and this is super common on news sites. You know, if, if we were just willing to have an image in there, we could just say, okay, cool, 
HTML tag. HTML already handles that. Images, congratulations. And you know, if we were really, really crafty, we could say, well, I bet you could jam that entire caption into the title tag or maybe the alt tag of the image. And then I bet we could just you know, do something crafty with jQuery and it'll reshuffle those. But then where, does, where do credits go? What, 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 what is credits in terms of like the alt or title tag? It, it, it gets unwieldy really fast. I'm, if, if you've worked in like news publishing or anything like that, you've heard people like going on and on about the uh, the snowfall article that the New York Times produced. Um, it was this giant, intense multimedia experience talking about um, a group of uh, hikers that you know got stranded in an avalanche in, in the middle of the mountains. Gripping story. Um, it is filled with little bits like this. The first time a particular person gets mentioned in the article, their name is highlighted and over in the sidebar alongside, of, alongside the portion of the article that talks about them, there's a bio of them. You know, it's John, he's 29, he's an editor of Powder Magazine. And if you actually you know, click on that, it expands into a little you know, bio. Some of them expand into little video interviews with the person, all kinds of craziness, cool stuff. Very, very compelling. High engagement. Um, <laughs> and then at various points, illustrating important key, you know, pivotal moments in the story, they have these little galleries embedded in it. You know, oh, wonderful, a gallery. Everyone loves galleries. There's descriptions. There's individual photos. You know, depending on what your device you're on, you can actually flip through them there. Or you could go to a different, you know, a little pop-up could display them. There's all sorts of ways you could display a gallery. But, you know, in this article, they did it a certain way. The problem is... The Snowfall article was like this giant moonshot effort with like a pile of developers and front end designers and writers and stuff like that. This is not a sustainable, reproducible kind of thing because of all of the random crap that had to be woven in here. This was not a writing exercise. This was not a content production exercise. This was a web development project in and of itself to create all of this stuff. Somebody out there is thinking, aha, that's why we need semantic HTML. Then we can just CSS our way through all this stuff. No. <laughs> no, that is not the answer. Semantic HTML is great. And I love the fact that CSS and you know, a huge emphasis on browser standards and cross-browser compatibility has meant that we're no longer like jamming all kinds of crazy, weird, crappy cruft and pixel spacers and you know stuff like that into our HTML to make it just so. But the problem is, no matter how semantic our HTML is, and this is, I think, about as semantic of a version of a photo gallery as I could come up with. You're missing a quote on your new track. Son of a, well. <laughs> I'm gonna blame Keynote. Um, I don't know why, but that's just safe. It's Keynote 6. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Always leave in a misspelling so the client feels they can contribute to the meeting. Yeah, that's well played. Um, so barring the fact that this will break, um, I, I think this is, this is actually pretty semantic. I'm using a figure tag. Um, inside of the figure tag, I've got an unordered list of links with images. So each one of those images in my gallery links off to a separate page for the, you know, for the individual image. I've got a caption here in a semantically appropriate fig caption tag. It's all awesome. There is like nothing in here that I could say is like design or presentation that's you know embedded in that, um, except for the fact that there's three photos instead of five or two or seven. There's a caption that is a snippet of text that links to another page as opposed to a longer narrative description or a title or credits. There are design decisions deeply embedded in even the most semantic HTML. And if I'm looking at something that can be reused or repurposed or, you know, or adapted in the future, I need to think about not just how pure and perfect the HTML is, but also what meaning I'm actually capturing with that pure and perfect HTML. And that's, that's a really big issue, even with the most semantic sites. No.
semantic HTML, not the answer. The deep problem that we keep facing is that there's a difference between browser meaning, the primitive building blocks of an HTML page, and content meaning. The idea of a gallery is not something that HTML has a vocabulary for. It has a vocabulary for the individual pieces that make up a particular presentation of a gallery. And it's really good at that. And we can solve that with you know semantic HTML, CSS, JavaScript, stuff like that. But it doesn't have any way to say, I have a gallery. It should go there. And this vocabulary mismatch goes all through the entire language that we're using to represent our content. I don't want to knock on any of the really, really useful um, additional semantic tags that have been added in the HTML5 standard, but things like aside, which is great for you know, call-outs and sidebar pieces and stuff like that, doesn't necessarily capture that this is a teaser for an individual piece of content. The, uh, the article tag in HTML5 doesn't really distinguish whether something is an article in and of itself or a representation of another article that really lives somewhere else. These are things that we have to build out of those HTML primitives. Things like a list versus a gallery or a paragraph versus something that is an author bio. In the future, if you decide that on your website what an author bio is and how it gets displayed and whether it always shows up or whether it needs a photo or whether it's just a link or something like that, those are questions that are not really affecting whether an article has an author bio, but they ripple out into design changes that gets us back into this whole structural HTML problem. I'm going to quote myself here. <laughs> It's my presentation. I can quote me. Um, HTML is rich enough for a designer to represent complex content, but not precise enough to describe and store that content in a presentation-independent form. There's that vocabulary mismatch we were talking about. And the real problem for us when we build content management systems or things that other people will be entering content into is that the WYSIWYG tools that they need to deal with these piles of HTML primitives that they're forced to use if they need to go beyond italicizing and underlining things is that the WYSIWYG tools we're giving them actually can make the problem worse. Because rather than shielding them from the complexity of HTML and the underlying little browser primitives that, that HTML describes things in, we're, give, we're making it easier for them to slam HTML primitives into a box using easy clickable buttons, but they still have to figure out how the heck to build the conceptual content stuff they're told they need to make out of these primitives. It's like giving someone a dictionary for the wrong language and asking them to go write an article. That's the real heart of the WYSIWYG problem that we keep running into. It's not that buttons are bad or easy is bad or people are lazy. It's that we keep giving them the wrong tools. And the results are predictable. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that WYSIWYG editors are bad. It just means that we have to think really, really hard about what it is that we give people with them. And also, it means that simply stripping down the WYSIWYG editor so that all they have is like basic italicized format, you know, you know, underlined link strong, just doing that doesn't actually help that much. Because unless they're only editing extremely simple content, when they need to actually represent this complex stuff that lives in the flow of their text, well, they're just going to come back and say, I, I, I think I need a div, uh, to tables. Can I put tables in there? I, I need to put things in there. And we're going to get right back to it. That's where the pure HTML, the pure perfect markup in the body field thing usually ends up running aground. Because at the end of the day, people do need to put goofy things in there sometimes. So meanwhile, I said I was going to talk about DITA and XML and all that crazy stuff. Has, has anybody ever heard of DITA before? Or are they familiar with it? Okay. Oh, this, ah, wow. Awesome crowd. Thank you. Thank you for being DITA people here. Um, it's the Darwin Information Typing Architecture. It's like a particular variant of XML that was created initially for technical documentation. 
And when I say technical documentation, I don't mean like a blog post on how to use Form API. I mean like the manuals for a 747 that come on a binder full of CD-ROMs, full of text. Like that's the kind of scale of content reuse and content validation. That's the kind of stuff that Ditto was designed for. An example would be, uh, uh, I think, um, most of the versions of the documentation for um, the Adobe Creative Suite, um, 14 languages, two platforms, God knows how many programs, all of those were written and edited in Ditto. Um, it's a very, very serious standard. Um, also, it's all about lots of XML files sitting there and not really a, any concept of a database system. So while the DITA people have figured out how to deal with all kinds of fluid, tangly, complex, semi-structured content in large narrative flows, we can still sort things without hiring a Java developer. So. <laughs> Let's, let's not underplay what we've achieved. Um, that's sort of my mental picture of the XML and Ditto world. They're doing crazy things, and they've got huge amounts of content. But strangely enough, there's like very, very little communication between our worlds. It's, it's very, very different. This is an example of some Ditto. Um, it looks like pretty familiar. Anybody who's worked with XML can probably look at it and figure out what's going on here. It's um, the main wrapper tag here is a task. And in DITA, because it's all about technical you know, documentation, task is one of the top level primitive elements that you can use to describe stuff in your content. Because you're often walking people through descriptions of a task they're about to perform. And there's a title for the task, and then there's a task body element. And inside of the task body, there are, there's a steps wrapper. And step one, step two, step three, there's an interesting little bit here. You can put an audience property on an individual step element and say, this step is only for retail employees of my company, but this step is only for corporate employees. So when this document I'm creating finally gets rendered out to the final web page or printed out in a manual, Manual, I could have the retail version of my manual and the corporate version of my manual. Or perhaps if I'm doing it on a web page, if somebody's logged in as a corporate employee or if they're logged in as a retail employee, I could switch those things as necessary. And then down here, after all the, you know, after all these tags are closed, there's a paragraph tag. And it's got this weird little um, attribute called a conref in Ditto World that's a content reference. So it's pointing at another XML file living somewhere. But it, this is text that will be replaced by a boilerplate um, legal disclaimer. It has this idea of like placeholder stuff in your page that what you're really doing is pointing to somewhere else in your pile of content and saying, after all of these steps, slap in the boilerplate legal text at the bottom. Now, we're used to handling that stuff, again, with like templates or themes or you know, page level things that the content editor never needs to know about or never needs to care about. But in these large, complex content scenarios where they're making this narrative flow, things like that gallery that we were talking about earlier, actually representing it with placeholders in the flow of the document and dealing with its structural needs somewhere else kind of makes sense. I think. Is anybody, is, I'm, I'm, I'm leading towards it. I'm, I'm suckering you into agreeing with me. <laughs> so some of the really important principles that the DITA community and uh, the XML community have uh, internalized are, one, you model and store, like in the actual markup of your documents, only the meaning. Task, step, you know, task body, title, things like that. Those are very precise terms that their community uses to explain what this thing I'm entering in is. Not how it'll look, not how, not how I think it's going to be used, nothing along those lines. They're not using unordered lists or ordered lists to represent, to represent those tasks because although an ordered list is handy, that's not a series of steps we are asking you to perform. It's just an ordered list, an, unord an ordered list. Oh, UL, OL, whatever. Um, and that's a really important principle. Um, an example would be like a tag like warning. 
and type of hardware. And the content of that tag, the content of that element is do not turn off the server. Now, if we were just, you know, throwing some content up there, it'd be easy to say, well, how about we just wrap it in a span and put class hardware warning or something like that. And from a pure HTML design perspective, thinking in terms of someone who is making an HTML page, that actually is perfectly fine. But from a content perspective, a div with a class of hardware warning is not the same thing as a warning element with a particular type. We're capturing meaning here regardless of how it ends up getting processed. And if you've ever actually tried to like write jQuery against stuff that people have had to enter in a WYSIWYG editor and they've been told that they're supposed to use certain styles or supposed to use certain things to get it to behave properly, you classes, while perfectly handy, are not a great way to capture real structural meaning. They're a great way to pass on information to CSS and even JavaScript and stuff like that, but it's, it's not perfect. The second thing that's really, really core in the DITA community and uh, the XML world is the idea that they, are, they extend a core vocabulary rather than expecting one particular standard to, to encompass every single user's termino terminology needs and markup needs. Um, for example, DITA, although it is not HTML, still borrows a lot of the tags and element types from HTML, things like M, strong, the P tag for wrapping paragraphs, things like that. It uses those. And the core DITA standard it's assumed that you, will, that you will extend on top of it with what they call specializations. For example, technical documentation is what DITA was originally designed for, but documenting, let's say, the things that a hospital worker needs to do while they're on their job may imply completely other vocabulary that will need to be present in the markup for it to actually capture the structural meaning. Um, so there are lots of different industry-specific specializations there. Um, and you can do things like use an A tag, and you could add, say, an attribute like, this is an unverified link, or it's a link that we've already vetted. You can add additional meaning onto there beyond simply stylistic information in CSS. But again, the core idea is there's a consistent base vocabulary, but it's assumed that it will be extended with special, for specialized needs. The other one is they're big fans of placeholder markup. Rather than embedding a giant blob of structure inside of something, whenever possible, placeholders are used to pull in stuff from other content resources. Now, in the XML world, that usually means pointing to another XML document somewhere and embedding it inside of this document. For us, that can mean things like pull in a node, pull in node 23 and display its teaser inside of the body of node 48. Because my gallery is over here, but this is the node that I want it displayed in. Or you could do things like, you know, show all of my attached image fields in a rotator right here. Rather than using the templates to display where, you know, to, to determine where they are, I'll store them in a field, but I'll show them right here in my document. The other one is assume that there is an additional step beyond simply entering the content before it actually gets sent out to a browser or an iPhone or whatever. It's the transformation step. Now, in the XML world, because they, they are absolutely determined to capture nothing but pure meaning, well, of course, you, you need to do some sort of post-processing to turn that into like an Adobe InDesign file that can be sent to the printers or you know, uh, an HTML document that can be fired off to a browser. Um, but that idea of like expanding those placeholders into the final, you know, the final actual content or transforming something like a step in their you know, multi-step instructions into an unordered list with some extra spans and maybe an image tag to go along with it. There's nothing wrong with, with, with turning that meaningful markup into browser-specific stuff as you go out, but the idea is that what people create and what you store isn't that final destination markup. And the final one is that you tailor the editing tools that people are given to the vocabulary of their content 
not the vocabulary of a particular output format. And this, again, is where the WYSIWYG thing keeps coming back to bite us, because what we almost always end up doing is like turning on more HTML tags in the WYSIWYG editor, rather than saying, well, okay, what are you trying to do? What are you not able to do with this? Oh, you keep wanting to put in references to books that are listed on Amazon? Okay, well, we could put an Amazon book button in your WYSIWYG editor. Store a tag that just stores an Amazon product ID, and we'll handle rendering it. Instead, we say, oh, well, okay, we'll give you links, we'll give you images, we'll let you float it left or float it right, because you'll need to do that. And they end up cobbling together those things out of those HTML primitives. Everything I've described is uh, wonderful and magical and, you know, full of, full of wonderful unicorns. Um, but I'm guessing that there are, are, are there, is everyone already just convinced? Should I just blow through this part? <laughs> I know Larry isn't. Just on principle, Larry can't agree with me on something. We have to battle it out. So I'll go forward. The first thing I want to make clear is this is not some sort of pie-in-the-sky future scenario for us in the Drupal world and in the web CMS world. Um, this is an example of uh, the, I think, uh, token embed, uh, token entity insert module. I can't remember. It has those three words. I can't remember the order they're in. Um, it basically lets you use uh, tokens, like you know, bracket, embed, node, node ID, um, inside of the body of a content to do that sort of gallery embedding stuff we were talking about. And there's even a button in the WYSIWYG editor that lets you click, I want to embed a thing here. It handles making the token for you and everything. That's something that we already have, we're already using on production sites. That's actually what um, the msnbc.com project uses to solve this particular problem. And it works well for them. There's issues with using tokens that I'll get to in a little bit, but that's very close to the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, this is, God help us, um, the Wikipedia edit box. Although it is in no, by no stretch of the imagination beautiful, although it is not a pretty editor, and it doesn't even really do any post-processing to format it the way it will look on a web page, it's really raw text. It's still a good assistive editor because all of the buttons that are up there, all of the tools that it provides people who are editing text on Wikipedia aren't about HTML primitives. They're about the specific vocabulary of editing text on Wikipedia. So it's got drop downs for things like template placeholders for you know particular common bits of text that need to be entered on certain kinds of articles. It's got things for doing you know, elaborate cross-references between different kinds of documents. The stuff that matters on Wikipedia is what this tool accounts for. Um, this, although it's a little bit washed out, um, is from a WordPress plugin called Post Snippets. Um, it's basically like a macro tool for WordPress. You can define little short codes yourself, like in this one I'm defining fig as a short code, and I can define you know, any number of attributes that I can put on a fig tag, and then I tell it what markup I want that expanded into when it's finally time to print the page. This is a very simple example, but I can say fig, caption, text, you know, and URL, and it will expand that into a fully captioned, you know, figure, caption, image file, stuff like that. Um, it can be used for all kinds of stuff, but the idea is that you, the person entering things doesn't have to represent, doesn't have to enter the whole structure, and this module then adds a one-click button to insert that short code in the, in the text that's being edited. Uh, this, although it's a little hard to make out, a little bit washed out, um, is actually the code from the media module for Drupal 8. Um, this is currently in progress. It lives on GitHub, but it actually does work with the current alpha of Drupal 8. Um, basically, it allows you to insert markup like this, a div. It uses data attribute tags for HTML5 to say, this is an embedded node. It's node ID 1. And I want the teaser view mode to be what's actually inserted. And while I'm at it, I also want a caption underneath that node. Now, this is interesting because this one isn't being handled by the media module. This is being handled by Drupal's built-in captioned image plugin for the for um, time, I'm sorry uh, for CK Edit. If 
any element has a data dash caption attribute on it, Drupal is smart enough to use an input filter to expand it into a figure, wrap the element in that, and then put a fig caption tag underneath it with the caption. And because it's using standard HTML5 markup, stacking data attributes on to capture the meaning and the important information, the media module pulling in a node and rendering its teaser inside of the body, and the captioning tool knowing that it should wrap it in a figure tag and then put the caption underneath it, both of those play nicely together, although they don't have any actual pre-existing knowledge of each other. They're both leveraging these tools and turning that very, very streamlined meaning markup into the full complex markup. And the cool thing is, is if you actually go to the large page that has that embedded, in place editing still works on the embedded node because it's still going through all of the normal Drupal rendering layers. If you embed node two on node one, you can go to node one and edit node two from it. Nodeception. <laughs> This is an example that I really love. It's uh, a particular CK editor plugin that uh, for the math heads in the room, you can enter pure text markup. <laughs> I know who likes math. Um, now, the thing is, is, if you actually gave someone HTML primitives to try to represent this stuff, it would be crap. They'd be do, wrapping stuff in spans, trying to figure out how to align things, size things, or whatever. Um, but it turns out there's already a language called Tex that most of the people who care about doing that already know. So this simply wraps something in a, hey, this is a chunk of Tex wrapper tag and renders it on output. What you store is text markup. What you get is wonderfully formatted stuff. Now, if you were really crazy, you could even do things like, you know, stuff that could be rendered into a 3D graph or something like that, rather than simply an equation. There are other libraries that let you actually do 3D rendering in the, in the browser. And you could, if you wanted to, build an, a layer that outputs stuff in that form, too. But the key is that you're storing the meaning and making the decision later about how to output it. So how do we make this happen? I've got, I think, what, three minutes? We can totally cover this. Um, so actually making it happen, it's already something that's going on in bits and pieces here and there. We're solving this problem of islands of structure inside of the body field in ways that work. But Ideally, we'd also get on the same page so that whenever we encounter one of these weird little islands of structure problem, we're solving it in the same way. So that just like the media embedding and the captioning stuff just working together because they're on the same page, all of our tools can do the same thing. The first one is, yes, build on top of HTML. Like it or not, we are a web publishing tool. We manage lots of different kinds of content, but for tools that, for, for projects that Drupal is being used on, most of the time, the web is a pretty important component of it. And there's nothing wrong with building on top of HTML. The paragraph tag, the M tag, and the link tag do not need to be reinvented. We don't need to go build a custom XML DTD from scratch before we give you know, content editors a field to enter things into. The next one is to start using data attributes on, our, on the elements that are being entered into our content when there's stackable behaviors, things that could apply to lots of different kinds of elements, but we want to capture them. Um, the, the caption tag that applies to images or block quotes or code fragments and stuff like that is a great example. Other things that we've actually done for clients, although sadly we can't release it, NDAs, <coughs> um, is an audience tag that we were able to add onto any element. It let us choose like a Drupal role that this particular snippet of text should be, uh, should be visible to. And in the WYSIWYG editor, it was just a, ma a matter of creating a plugin that added a span with a particular data attribute onto it. Let people select it, write the CSS so that inside of the editor, that text got special highlighting. But when it was actually output, a Drupal filter handled either removing it from the markup that was being shown or allowing it to stay there, depending on the role of the viewer. That's a simple behavior that could be used almost anywhere in the markup, but once we'd implemented it, it stacked really nicely. And because we were doing it with standard HTML data attributes, it didn't collide with other things. The other one is start accepting that defining a custom element may make sense for self-contained things that are 
an important unit of content that goes in there. Um, an example would be like a glossary term. I want to insert our company's 800 number right here in the text, but the 800 number differs from country to country. Or we need an icon next to it that indicates whether the call center is open or closed at the time that the person is viewing it. That's all stuff that's very easy if you're using those kinds of placeholders, but it's a huge, huge pain if you're expecting people to actually create special markup to enable those things every time they type the 800 number. And the, and the final one is accept that this transformative step, turning the meaningful markup that we're adding into the final destination markup, that transformational step is not a sign that we haven't built a good enough WYSIWYG editor or we haven't given people powerful enough tools to edit it. That's a good sign. It means we're letting them edit what they need to and we're doing the hard work on, on output. Um, the cool part is, is that there are lots and lots of options once we start using HTML stand, HTML5 standards. Things like a Drupal filter can handle this post-processing of turning, you know, simplified, you know, meaning markup into final HTML output. Um, in in Symfony, there's crazy stuff like response handlers that can even intercept the fully rendered Drupal page before it actually goes out over the wire. And you could run a single regular expression over the whole thing and replace lots of different stuff all in one fell swoop if you don't want to use a Drupal filter. You can write, write jQuery plugins on the client side that pick up on particular data attributes or catch special tags that you've added in. Angular directives, if anybody's been hearing about AngularJS, maybe, you probably stumbled over Angular, Angular JS developers this week. Um, Angular directives are all built around this idea of defining the behavior that a particular um, data attribute should add onto something on the client side. Um, you can also, um, if you're outputting things to uh, via a content API or something like that, when meaning is captured in this way, it makes it much, much easier to map the meaning that's inherent in your content to however the destination handles that particular meaning. Turning something into JSON or sending it over the wire to somebody who expects a very particular goofy XML format or something like that. Once, you did, once you're determined to store the meaning rather than destination like uh, markup in HTML, mapping between formats gets way, way easier. So that's it. Store just the meaning in our markup. Tailor the, quote, WYSIWYG tools to the vocabulary of the content that people are using rather than the HTML primitives that we think it's going to be rendered to. And accept that there's always going to be a transformative step to render things into the final presentational form, even if there's some HTML that's being entered into the body field. And what we get from that is it's a lot easier to build tools that match the vocabulary of an organization's content that makes actually editing the content easier for people who aren't HTML designers, but instead are domain experts on what the heck is going on inside of their company. And they understand that company's internal concept and what they deal with, but they may not know how to turn that into an HTML design. It gives us cleaner integration with external systems that aren't necessarily HTML or aren't necessarily using the same designs that we've got. It actually makes WYSIWYG implementation simpler because keying on known data attributes or catching custom tags that we're using to, to capture that meaning, it's a lot easier to write a WYSIWYG ed editor plugin that keys on those things than one that actually tries to become like a little dream weaver in a box inside of the body field. And finally, it gives us a much easier way to do a smooth transition into future standards, things like web components. Um, and as AngularJS is taking off more and more and more, because we're capturing meaning, and because we're, we would be using things like HTML5 custom elements, HTML5 data attributes, we'd already be on the way to using the stuff that the future web is being built out of. That's all really cool stuff. Um, that's all I've got here. There's a bunch of stuff that I've been like fire hosing at you. Um, the media project is actually a really good place to look at right now as Drupal 8 evolves. But again, these are techniques that aren't restricted to some crazy point in the future. These are stuff we can do now. We can improve the lives of our editors and we can improve our own lives as we have to deal with crazy, unpredictable design changes and stuff like that. It's great stuff, I think. That's all I got. Thank you.
<laughs> it looks like we've still got like eight minutes or so until uh, until everybody turns into I don't know. It's the last day. So. It's the last day. Hey, shoot, anybody who wants to hang out here and talk about st semi-structured content, let's do it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, well, recently. We're looking into alternatives to media modules since it's totally messed up all the time in the WYSIWYG. And we tried Asset Module, which has been around for a really long time, and it was incredibly awesome. And you, you can create different entity types and just put buttons for them in your WYSIWYG. Have you ever used that? I have not actually used that. I, I've mostly stuck with Media Module, but that sounds it's very interesting. It's incredibly awesome, and it's like gorgeously designed and you can put captions on things and mm -hmm. you can have create you know just any fieldable entity and just shove it in your WYSIWYG and reuse them. It's Interesting. It's that is actually what the Media in 8 project right. is doing. It's got that entity embed module. But yeah, I mean it, it's not so much that I'm, you know, I'm extremely like married to Media module as the thing that must be used well, for I, this. I thought that, you know, Media module the, the Drupal 7 one was what you know the standard was, and there must not be anything better out there because no one talks about it. Then I try Asset, and it's like... For Drupal, for Drupal 8, Asset and Media Module are merging. Ah, yes, the two projects are actually collaborating on Drupal 8, so maybe that's where the combined awesomeness came from. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> uh, two questions. Well, one question, one comment. Uh, First question is short. It is tokens. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it, you mean are, are tokens an option for this? Tokens was the question. Uh, I'll I'll take liberties with the structure sure, form of sure, that question. Yeah, yeah. I'll just take it in. A, I'll take it where I want. Um, <laughs> yes, tokens. Um, as an alternative to embedding lots of, you know, large swaths of stru structural markup, tokens today are still a really good alternative to that. You know, we're using them on the MSNBC project to do um, entity embedding inside of node bodies because, well, it's implemented and it works. It exists. It required zero code, just installation and configuration of the WYSIWYG editor. To be fair, configuration of the WYSIWYG editor today is probably what, like, uh, a person year, um, yeah. But I guess I guess maybe to make the question better, like what are what are maybe shortcomings of of those? Well, oh, oh, let me tell you about the shortcomings of token. <laughs> yeah. Um, one that bracketed syntax makes it e really easy to recognize when you're like staring at markup and saying, "Oh, that's a token right there." The problem is, is token is a string of colon delimited bits, like. This is an embed. It is a node. It is node one. Mm -hmm. Here is the caption for it. Also, you should float it left. The token API has no support for things like an optional parameter there. Or, say, a caption that includes a colon. Right. Because so, it's colon right. delimited. Um, would the, like, making those look more like HTML tags, is that duplicating HTML? Or is that be I don't because think of like, a visual, yeah, I, I don't the think visual it, distinction is kind of nice, you know? Um, well, I would say that the ideal is we create markup using HTML tags, data attributes, or even custom elements when it's you know justified, um, and assume that that's how it'll be stored. If we want to represent them differently, so people don't mess, so people don't confuse it, then that's a perfectly legitimate use case for a WYSIWYG editor because the WYSIWYG editor can supply what that type of insertion placeholder should look like in the editor. Yeah. And then do it some do some other completely different thing on output, and that's where I like to think of a WYSIWYG editor's really really proper role as being an assistive editor for the meaningful structure, not like an in-browser design tool. Right. Okay. And the criticism part is is uh, Snugug here? He's the same oh, okay. <laughs> well, of course he is. Um, I I was having this conversation with him about Markdown. And oh, freaking Markdown. And about how if if he, Markdown he is an acceptable argument. answer, then you don't have this problem. Okay, sure, <laughs> sure. But the he he was making the argument that, um, and this is this is just maybe a rebuttal to some of these points, but mm -hmm. um, 
in the use case where you have people writing simple narrative content, mm -hmm. Markdown is a solution. Yes. In these cases where you have very complicated narrative things, and this was his, this is, these are his words, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, those kinds of things you will never be able to abstract to the point where we can essentially empower anyone to create that kind of National Geographic looking layout well, in a node and that if you want to do that as a publisher, you should hire someone who – and so there, you know, a hierarchy of authors, some of which you can do simple things, some of which you can do more, more complicated things. I concur. Yeah. I, I actually agree, and I'm going to toss you a pack of Skittles for providing a perfect opening to something that I did not have time to put into my presentation right, directly. I'll, I'll get off the mic now. Um, <laughs> Um, so just to sort of summarize that, the idea is because there is so much unpredictability and so much craziness that you could potentially try to jam into the body field, essentially it's like just keep it as simple as possible and treat anything beyond like boom, article, as a special design challenge. Um, I, I am not quite as fatalistic about that. I don't think that we can create just an arbitrarily flexible structure making thing. That's not what I'm necessarily saying, but rather I'm saying in most organizations, there are lots of recurring patterns in the kinds of complex bits that get put in there. And identifying those and making provisions for them with custom tags and assistive tools and stuff like that gives the flexibility so that everything doesn't ultimately drift into being one of those one-off, give them a web designer because they need to write a news article kinds of scenarios. Um, I think it was The Guardian, actually. Um, oh, I can't remember. It's either BBC or The Guardian. Um, they put up a really interesting article on their, um, on their account strategy Tumblr. Go figure. Um, about what they call data picks. Um, it, the idea is it was this recurring thing they, they first did in an article about like honeybee die off. Um, but it was a way of sort of doing an infographic, sort of doing a link and sort of doing information. It was a photograph, a statistic, um, explanatory text and a citation link all wrapped in sort of a collection. And they were just doing it as a one-off. They had a web designer go in because the person who was writing the story said, I really need some way to do this. And then the minute they did it, like they started getting requests. Everybody wanted one of those in their articles. And after maybe, you know, a couple of weeks of getting lots and lots of requests, they broke that out and they started treating it as a standardized piece of structure that could be done without any kind of manual design um, you know, interference. And I think that's actually the really, really solid way forward. It's not so much that you plan everything else, you know, plan everything out in some sort of giant you know, content waterfall, but rather when the special needs come up, you deal with them, but rather than just throwing HTML primitives at people and telling them to sort it out for themselves, you help them, and if it keeps being in need, you automate it. I think that's, a, I, that, that's, my, that's my standard answer on it, but uh, I definitely recommend looking up the uh, data picks article as an example of how that can be an organic process rather than just like a giant developer project where a thing gets handed to an editor. Yes. Hi. Uh, Another potential solution to this problem, full, full disclosure, I'm working on a contrib module for, ha -ha. that implements this, but I'm curious to know your thoughts, um, is to take those mini blobs and transform them into a series of mini chunks. I, okay, so actually, um, this particular link, the way you design web content is changing, um, is all about that particular approach. And I think there are a lot of scenarios where that's really, really effective. The challenge is, if it's actually inside of a long piece of narrative text, it can really seriously disrupt the experience of actually editing and maintaining the narrative text itself. Because what you're doing is you're taking a story or an article and breaking it up into a bunch of really, really distinctly separate, like, database-y chunks mm -hmm. that are reassembled by a template. And it can be really good for things like, you know, product overview pages where you're essentially, like, stacking different actual chunks. Here's the product description. I want a selling point about this particular feature 
your selling point about this particular feature, you know, call to action and then details. And I want marketing people to be able to come in and rearrange those or swap something in the middle. But that's not quite the same. It's related. And that's actually one of the reasons that I put this link uh, in the slides. I'll, I'll be pushing out the PDF. But I think that's a good solution for certain types of problems, but not quite the same thing for the pure narrative flow with embedded structure thing. Cool. Thanks. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> uh, Brian Hirsch, White House uh, Web Team, thank you so much for your thoughtful presentation. Um, you know, so uh, we are in the process of, uh, of trying to go responsive with whitehouse.gov, and my mind is racing now with, you know, what would it look like to make a WYSIWYG that stores meaning, you know, and later gets transformed. So here's a here's a half baked idea to add to the list of possible. Those ways are the to best kind. <laughs> so and I, you know I'd love to talk more with you at the bar or anyone else who's interested uh, about ways to do this. Um, so yesterday I attended a great presentation on aesthetic, which is going to be included in Drupal 8, and that seems to me like it could be a compelling way to you know store store something meaningful somewhere. I have no idea what aesthetic is. So aesthetic is uh, going to be used in Drupal 8 for asset management. Okay. And so, you know, lower down in the stack than uh, altering a fully rendered page in, you know, the Symphony response. Um, assets get grabbed by a set. Of, I really know very little about this. This is a very, you know, it's a way of like thing. capturing, I want image blah, and a set of handles, oh, that's on an Amazon S3 bucket, or oh, that's on your local dev workstation while you're working on it locally, or something like that. Yeah, but you can apply all kinds of things to transform it along the way. Yes. So that, that's in, in the slide on different ways that transformational step can happen. That's, you know, like responseless, you know, response handlers in Symphony are actually one of the ways that can do that. Um, initially, I was thinking that some of the things that I'm trying to get done here are, would require that approach in D8. But since then, there's actually been some improvements to the filtering system that make it one of several options we have for doing that transformation on the server. But yeah, it's, I, I absolutely agree. And I think there's a lot of scenarios where like an organization that has a lot of consistent needs like this that are going to be applied to a lot of pages, it might actually be more efficient to build something like aesthetic that they just pipe everything through rather than trying to go in and monkey around with all of their input filters and, and implement it in that way. So the thing, last quick comment, the thing that, that strikes me is potentially compelling about aesthetic rather than uh, the filtering system in Drupal is that, you know, aesthetic, the, the meaning that we're describing is generic, right? It's not tightly coupled to Drupal logic. There's nothing node-y uh, about it or entity-y uh. about it. Uh, so, you know, to collaborate with a project like aesthetic and make it a generic plugin that can be yes. used outside of Drupal also. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, and especially in large, or large organizations that face this problem a lot, they are, they are likely to face the same transformation needs in things other than Drupal-based websites. Exactly. So, you know, any ways that we can standardize that stuff, whether it's web components or a standardized server-side tool that does that handling, yeah, that's big thumbs up. Thanks. So I'm going to give you a nice little softball. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone who's dealt with clients mm -hmm. has had the conversation of, no, structured <laughs> content, it's a thing. You're not doing Dreamweaver in the browser. Yeah. And, and they say, no, but we want Dreamweaver. Yeah, I, or I rather, Microsoft Word. Yeah. yeah. I need flexibility. I don't get the structure thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had that conversation with. And flexibility is assembly language. Yeah. And I've, I've had that conversation with eh, three quarters of the clients I've yeah. ever dealt with, at least. And only some of them I'm able to convince because the others aren't listening. <laughs> this is how most of our Twitter arguments start. This is going to be good. So now we're adding another layer where we have chunks, blobs, structures within blobs. Those structures could be defined in line or referenced to a chunk or blob elsewhere. This poses an enormous usability problem for the content editor even assuming that you've been able to structure things from the developers, leaving aside the developer challenges of building this, you know, which are surmountable, we're smart, for editors, the potential for inconsistency in the UI or in predictability in the UI is enormous when you have at least four different levels at which you could be thinking about what it is I'm typing where. We have all those levels today. 
We just only implement two of them. <laughs> I, I guess, I mean, yes, the answer is if we do a bad job on UI design, the editorial experience will suffer. But I think, at least in my experience, across a bunch of websites, that's not something that we escape by not doing this. I'm not suggesting we don't. Right. I'm just saying, how, how, do, how do we, we sell it? How do, how do we, we plan ahead how do we say, you know what? You've got a node edit form. You've got the body field in it. You've got this button that gives you a pop-up within it that may be referencing something else or maybe something you edit inline. And sometimes you'll want one, sometimes you want the other. Teaching the content editors when they're going to be using which one and explaining to them why, you know, in this this use case it makes sense to do this of those five options, this one and, and that, and making that predictable, that poses an enormous UX challenge. I would say that's our job. I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm just saying that's a challenge it, that should not be overlooked. No, I, I don't think it should be overlooked. But right, I mean, Mike. But yes, the that was a uh, uh, in the background. Someone was saying that's the same the same problem that P, that clients face with the print process, and we've seen that tra same transition with responsive design with designers who've come in from a print background and aren't familiar or comfortable with the idea of making design systems that adapt. There's, but I, I think it goes. A, yeah. it's a step beyond that because it's more people who have to deal with more levels of question as they're entering content. I would say that ideally they, few, they, they would face fewer questions because the affordances they're offered in the UI correspond to the tasks they're being asked to perform rather than them being given HTML primitives and told to translate those to the tasks they're, they're being asked to perform. And mapping those things correctly is like our job in the same way that figuring out what fields we're going to break out and what we're just going to allow in the body field as part of the modeling process. Figuring out that like, oh, hey, they keep needing, you know, they, they need to get recipes slapped in the side, you know, slapped into these articles all the time. So we're going to make that something that there's a provision for rather than simply giving them a style guide and a bunch of HTML buttons. That's the kind of shift that um, I'm talking about. Not necessarily like some sort of ideological mission to get XML in there or something. It's because this approach allows us to simplify the problem space that they're presented with rather than expanding it. Then I'll give you the question I expect someone to ask. If we build these wonderful body field, semi-structurable edi editing things, client asks, okay, so why do I have any fields on my node other than the body? What's your answer? For supporting assets that don't need to actually live at a particular place in there, for metadata that may not actually appear as part of the body field, you know, there's a number of reasons why having a separate box on the input form is actually beneficial to editors. A prompt for a file upload is different than just, you know, a giant bin. Um, I mean, some people may be perfectly happy with just a giant bin and supporting tools that do structure in there. But again, it's like, you know, that's the way the, the XML document-oriented community does content editing, and we don't have to hire Java developers to sort things. So there's a benefit to having a database to go along with that. Microphone. Oh, microphone. While he's coming up to the mics, there are, uh, oh. Donna. I, oh, it is like Donna Hugh. <laughs> Can we assume our content editors know about the content they're creating and not assume they're morons? Well, that's a tough nut right there. Um, but again, even assuming that a content editor is literally coming in fresh off the street, knows nothing about the business, knows nothing about HTML, I think that if the affordances we provide to them correspond to the business that, and what its needs are, to the content that they're expected to produce, rather than being HTML primitives that they're expected to build that content out of, I still think we're closer, and the training challenge is at least simpler than, than what we have today. I only had one quick thing to interject, and that's that my experience with content editors is that you can give them a node or content edit screen that's a mile and a half long, and they will be fine with it as long as it meets their needs and has everything that they're after. Yes, it's, it, that's been my experience too. The problem is never, this is so long. Rather, it's, 
this isn't what I'm trying to do. There's all these fields that don't correspond to what I care about, and that actually matters way more. I think I'm going to ask maybe the flip side of the question that Larry asked. So we, ha so in Drupal, we have. Uh, Oh. <laughs> um, so in Drupal, we have uh, you know entity types and mm -hmm. fields and a field UI and and God and, bless and, them right? all. And so right, you can make you can make this you know different view modes and configure exactly how you want something to look as a teaser versus another thing. And then you can build views off of all that. And and just to interject, the media module that embeds entities inside of other entities, one of the things that it ships with is an embedded display mode. So you can even right. set up a display mode for when this entity is embedded somewhere else, it doesn't just have to be the teaser. I can explicitly say what an embedded version looks like. So that, yes. I, I think that ties in. Yes. Okay. So, yes. Uh, so, you know, so did is great because it, it has this concept where you can build, you know, task lists. And for some values are great. Yes. It also, to be fair, did namespace includes something like, th I think two or 300 basic tag types. Okay. So it's, okay. it's complicated. <laughs> So I think a lot of use cases could be solved with, you know, build, you know, build out node bundles, build out field collection bundles, build views. If you really need a custom entity type that's not well represented with a node or a field collection, build a custom entity type and then bundles off of that. And if you and need that stuff to live inside of narrative flow, flow then you then you embed via the, you know via media or whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you you embed you know an entity, you embed a field that's on the same node that you're you're on, or you embed a view. And in so, that in that world. The concept of an entity or the concept of a node becomes sort of like a manifest for a particular piece of content. It's narratives that it has, supporting elements that it has, whether it's references or media elements and stuff like that. Yeah. So then my question is, what, what do you see as a use case for then building a special like WYSIWYG plugin that captures like some kind of data meaning in something that's not an entity or a field collection. An example, like one of the examples I fall back on is um, I wrote an article for um, for a blog that had a very specific house style for how um, citations of articles elsewhere were supposed to be um, created. They didn't just want a link off of the off there. They wanted the actual originally published title. They wanted the URL. They wanted the author's name. They wanted a date, and they wanted it in, inside of a particular span structure so that their current design could do some special handling of that that they wanted. That's not like, that didn't correspond to any particular tag, like a site tag or something like that. And they hadn't broken that out into like separate fields or something. They just wanted when you referred to an external site in some way, all of that stuff got captured. And it was a huge pain. Um, and it was just on the side of, does it really make sense to like make that a separate field and then have an embed code for that? Um, that, in my opinion, might be a useful case where creating like a house style tag where you've just got attributes that you dump all those things into. There's a WYSIWYG editor the same way we have a link you know, editor in, in, the, Wiz, in, in the WYSIWYG tool. Um, and then it gets exploded into whatever structural markup that they need. That's the kind of scenario where I think it could be justifiable. But in Drupal, we have so many tools at our disposal to actually break structured things out into separate little pieces and then insert them. But I think that sort of embedding of a field or embedding of an in individual entity is probably going to be one of the things that we lean on a lot. Okay, cool. Because I think for a lot of organizations, especially like small and medium-sized ones, you know, they're not going to want to like be like, oh, I need to hire someone to build me a custom CK editor plugin for my version of a task list. Right. And when they already have Drupal tools that let them... And, and in addition, out. like that post... Um, like that post snippets um, tool for WordPress, um, it let you actually define some of those sort of house style expansion macros and stuff like that using just a, a, you know using an admin page. And I think that kind of approach could probably handle a lot of those weird middle ground cases while still enforcing standard structures. Um, yeah, it, yeah. So we're really not. Like Drupal is not really all that far. No, from no, that's this. the thing. It's like the answer is actually way simpler than describing the problem accurately. <laughs> cool. Thank you. How often does that happen? I don't know, but it's it's fantastic. So I'm just wondering with your token insert solution. Um, say I'm trying to do something <coughs> as simple as enter like an image float right. It's got a caption. It's got some fields. I don't want them to junk it up. So I want it fielded. 
Is this the kind of thing, like, is that going to be an entity in and of itself, or is that a field collection? That, that's that the kind of stuff that the media there? team is heatedly debating right now. But, okay. like, it, um, in D8, just in the core, you know, Drupal 8 core, the way it ships, the image, like, icon in the WYSIWYG editor is not just a standard CK plugin. Right. It's actually a Drupal-specific insert an image WYSIWYG editor plugin that does things like captioning via data attributes and when you hit, say float left, float right, or center, it's not adding custom alignment attributes, it's actually adding a data attribute that a filter post processes into that so that if it needs to change based on other needs, I mean, you know, Drupal Core is already even doing some of that for simple solutions like that. So on more complex solutions like a slideshow, like on your MSNBC site, what's the user experience like when they're creating that? Like, it's it's just literally like an ad slideshow. Yeah. It's, so they're it's, not like having to go like, oh, crap, I got to go make my slideshow <coughs> first so I can do my token. Insert. Well, yeah. yeah. Right yeah. now, they do have to create the slideshow okay. first. Um, okay. But that's that's that was that was more of a timeline question than a is it possible question. Right. There's already a couple of different tools in the Drupal space that like when you're creating something that's being referenced on node A, you can go into a sub page and create node B before it gets referenced. Um, and that I think is just, it's been done, it's just the meat and potatoes work of, you know, wiring all the parts together on a particular project. Okay, thank you. So um, I, I, I guess I was under the mistaken impression that you might be talking also about um, uh, RDFA and, 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 and schema.org and how that relates to the structuring of data in the body field. Um, but you didn't really touch on that at all. No. I, I mean, I think it's really cool that, we, that you, know, um, you know, sort of adopting, um, uh, you know, or if not adopting did a, you sort of emulating certain <laughs> I, standards. I, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting we adopt data in Drupal. <laughs> saying there's a lot right. we can learn right. from. Right, yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> Emulate or learning from standards. But, yeah. you know, but it seems to me that, you know, that sort of leads towards creating, you know, another sort of taxonomy of meaning through our markup where we have this great taxonomy of meeting from schema.org, and why don't we, you know, use that also for this purpose? I mean, it can do two things. It can do the. It can. It can. It can serve the purpose of you know of of describing things to external machines, right? Yeah. Um, but it can also serve the purpose, couldn't it? I mean, I pose the question: Couldn't it also serve the purpose of? adding this level of meaning, uh, you know, internally for, for, for the reuse of these things and the structuring of them. Yeah, I mean, I, do, I don't think those things are incompatible at all. Um, but the idea that what I'm hoping we can get away from is the idea that what we actually put in the body field while editing and persist to disk, you know, or memory if you're using MariaDB or if you decide you want to save your nodes to memcache because you're insane or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, what, what, what's actually persisted does not have to have a one-to-one -one correlation with the actual output format. And if using RDFA information on the in, on, on, at the content level captures the meaning that your editors need to capture, then I would say that's perfectly reasonable and, and perfectly fine to use. Because ideally, the specifics of what's being marked up underneath it could be transparent to someone who's using a WYSIWYG editor to actually do the input. The challenge is when the tools that they're being asked to use to input it aren't actually corresponding well to the kinds of content meaning they're trying to encode. Does that right. make sense? It, it, do, it does make sense. It does make sense. I'm just concerned about the, the you know, that you know, we already have been working hard at, you know, well, not me, but, you know, SCORE and all the we, people who work I mean, hard on the this royal stuff. We, um, have been working I haven't on worked on anything. <laughs> I just make presentations, uh, so. But, you know, <laughs> other people are working really hard on, 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 on getting, you know, on, on getting good usability around getting, um, you know, getting RDFA into our, uh, you know, our, our markup and getting it linked to, to schema.org. So there's a level of meaning there already. And if we want to use that level of meaning for, for other things, why, why add this other taxonomy you know, of stuff? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I, I like, for example, an author bio being inserted at the bottom of an article or something like that. Um, RDFA, at least my understanding of it, it's been a while since I've looked at it, 
it's a means of communicating the meaning of random markup to machines on on the other side so that they can figure out what your actual intent in this blob of markup actually is. Right. Um, from a content perspective, that whole blob of markup might not even be what I deal with. I may have just like the equivalent of like a token insertion type thing that says insert user 52's bio here. And that tag that I'm using at the editing in the editing interface may never actually be, even be reflected in the final markup that, uh, that say, a crawler sees. It may be expanded into the markup that includes RDFA tags and stuff like that. Right, but the but 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 schema gives us things like bio and you know type of you know <laughs> you know uh, author and you know date and all all kinds of you know that gives us all kinds of actual. Um, you know, taxonomies for, for describing these things. Yes. You know, right. It's not, it's, it's, I mean, it, I, I guess in situations where the vocabulary that's being provided by like schema.org has a one-to-one -one correlation with what's being entered in by an actual editor, then I would say by all means it makes sense to leverage that rather than going off and you know inventing our own custom tag type or something like that. Um, but I, I like to think of this as being more in line with things like you know the W3C standards on you know web components and stuff like that, where you know well I don't want to insert a video, I want to insert a photo gallery or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know rather than trying to wrangle a pile of markup or something like that, you would create a you know, a gallery tag, include the information that's necessary to be passed along to that web component and have it expanded there, which, right. um, but that web component may expand it into things that use RDFA tags on the individual elements, like who is the person who took this photo, you know, what is the, you know, what are the, what's the copyright on this photo and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, it could absolutely be used, but one of the advantages is that can be handled purely programmatically on you know, the templating system and stuff like that, even if the editing interface is as simple as gallery four needs to go here. No, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, in a project that I worked recently, we have like this issue that you described that we, there, there are so many like images, galleries, and things that need to go in this exact place, and we have the whole discussion about WYSIWYG, and our solution, and I would like to know your thoughts about that, was getting rid of it at all. So what we did, uh, we said, I mean, uh, in the content types, we define so many, like, pieces, fields, individual fields for so many things, where for the thing that needed to be dynamic, uh, what we, we, we did was, uh, like, a dynamic body, which actually was entity reference of pins. And we created a whole set of pins where, for example, we needed a Twitter uh, to show some Twitters. So the bin only accepted the Twitter handle, and then in, in the back end, we make these transformations and present them as needed. Or if we need a paragraph, we need captions, we need images floated to the left or right, that those are things that were defined like in the specific bins. And I, uh, you know, in in the, the in a body where you are editing, uh, you just like add or reference those beans, and then the whole thing gets built. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where that's what our solution. But uh, that worked great when testing. But when we came out to you know move to production, we have to import like twenty thousand articles, and for each paragraph we had a bean. Yeah. And imagine like. Uh, images, uh, sliders, and the whole thing. So we ended up like with fifty thousand beans. Yeah. We needed to hook alter, uh, hook implement alter to that uh, for the blog page broke. Yeah. So no, I mean, and, and, and that's that's. I, I think that was sort of touches on what was mentioned in one of the earlier questions. You know, that idea of like stacking reusable blocks and assembling right. pages out of them. It can be really useful, but when you find yourself in those situations where we've just got a pile of text and things need to live in them, it can also mean that whatever entity you're breaking those pieces of text into, suddenly you're just buried in them. And right. that's one of the reasons that I like to see whether or not like you know, an example might be, you know, tokens to embed a particular bean inside of the flow of text rather than actually breaking up 
all of the text into individual right. beans. So like it's just text for the stuff that's just text, but insert a Twitter fee stream right here or something like that can be handled using entities. Uh, and one thing that this allowed us, uh, and it was in your slides that this we see we see with things break mobile uh, styles. Since we're using Bean, we were able to uh, define for this Bean how it should look like in the desktop version and in the mobile version. Yeah, it le lets so, you like encapsulate the responsive right. rules in the right. element. So yeah. I mean that was really helpful. But when you know when it is like in production and it is working, I mean it's solved our problem, but. It introduces so many things that we needed to take care of later. Then, I mean, maybe if we have like an a, a go-to solution, that would be really, you know, better. But yeah, well, thank you. So help me out on this one. Should I be proud of you or disappointed in you that you have yet to use the word transclusion? Wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, transclusion. We call it embedding. <laughs> Technically, in like the you know in 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 the community of people who use words like transclusion casually, this is transclusion. <laughs> it's taking a particular thing and including it inside of another thing um, via the use of some sort of tag or something like that. Yeah. An actual question. <laughs> So one of the things we're you said also like six thirty. So anyone who feels the need to go and get a <laughs> beer is welcome to. I'm just going to be here till they cut the power, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier that slapping classes on div elements is not actually a content definition mechanism. And I'm not going to disagree with that. But at what point do you say the same thing about slapping data attributes on a div is also not a data definition? Data mechanism. attributes are at least namespaced. You can have multiple ones of them to include data from different sources, whereas classes are really just a giant pile that everyone stacks stuff into. So theoretically, like the same problem is there, but you at least have the advantage of like, you know, you can define the data attribute that you need and populate it not worry about whether or not you're colliding with someone else's class or whatever random class the designer who was working on the front-end style sheet happened to use. So you're less likely to fight with the themer, but otherwise it's the same problem. It, 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 at the very least, kicks it down the can until you know we're all defining data attributes and there's dozens and dozens of those on a single element. It could happen, but it's better. So what would be your guideline for when slapping a data attribute on a div is sufficient versus defining your own custom element mechanism thing? Well, um, I know in some cases where people are just using data attributes regardless and just saying we use divs. And I think that that works today. But like the, the rule of thumb that I, that I, I think I put in there was um, data attributes are good for things that stack. Like a thing that is captioned gets this data attribute rather than wrapping something in a custom caption tag or something like that. You can then apply the captioning behavior to images, galleries, embedded nodes, whatever. Whereas an individual freestanding thing itself, like this is an embedded gallery. I would never put galleriness onto a paragraph because by definition that paragraph would then become a gallery. You know, you would want to instead use the gallery tag inside of or between two paragraphs or something like that. That's the rule of thumb that I tend to go towards. But like this kind of question is the philosophical stuff that the XML and DITA communities, like because they live in the world of markup, but they need good, solid, meaningful structure, like this is what they consider the work of content modeling. When we think of it as, what should be a field? What should be a type? They're thinking about those questions in terms of markup structures. And like that's the kind of stuff that we can at least look at how they deal with those kinds of questions when we try to figure it out, because they've been spending 20 years on it. Well, isn't um, the transclusion notion lowercase token, if you will, lowercase um, t? Yeah. It's, it's a, a bucketing mechanism yeah. where you can bring in content of some type and display it. And whether it's an image with fields or some other kind of content, holding just the token seems the right way to do it to me because it's at runtime that you have to do things like check for licensing or, I mean, all these other issues that, yep. that come up in enterprise content management but, but are, are normal run-of-the-mill things too, like putting an image in content area. It just seems like that um, 
that's that seems to be the way forward to solve putting in almost any kind putting of Putting a thing content. in a thing. Right. We should probably use that technique. Right. And then the classes would be the things that would be applied by the editor in order to do things like say, I want this paragraph to be an intro or I want this paragraph to split into two columns on a wider screen. Those that's to bring the editorial design into the editorial content structure. It seems like we have these things. It's just the media module is not quite robust enough to... Yeah, and, and I don't think that media module... I think media module is an example of this technique being used effectively, not the tool by which this technique will be applied in all cases. Right. Um, like, the ability... like. Um, I mean, and there's some things that I don't think need to live inside of the markup flow. Like um, on the MSNBC project, one of the things they wanted to do was editors, when creating a news story, had to be able to choose what should lead that story. A video, a still image, um, a pull quote from the story that they thought was particularly like snappy. It was all the same content type, but one of the things that they chose, one of the, one of the metadata fields that they selected was what should the emphasis on this story be, like photo, quote, whatever. And that allowed them to sort of pass design-ish kinds of decisions towards, you know, like, was that design? Because it was still like the templating and the design system that handled what leading with the quote actually turns into, but they were still right. making those decisions. Right. Um, and I think that's, it, it's always going to be a fuzzy sort of line between what is design and what is, you know, meaning decision, but mm. there's, there's a lot of room for improvement before we run into like the, the pure platonic form of design <laughs> and, and meaning separation, I think. That'll never happen. <sighs> Okay, one more question. So if anyone's done imports of other, you know, content that used to be some sort of version of HTML. Hell is other people's markup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's particularly challenging. You have to go through if there were any images that were embedded. Is this a remote image that I can just keep there? Do I have to import yeah. this? I mean, but even with tokens, right, it's also very much a pain in the ass to kind of all right, well, this is node ID 4, at least we're using migrate module. Well, and, and to be clear, media module also lets you use UUIDs, the actual unique identifier, rather than just node IDs. So, like, they're, they're at least putting some thought into that kind of stuff. And, like, like glossary text insertion and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we did do that for a client, we used machine names on those things, not IDs, because saying insert the 800 number here is easier than insert glossary item 59, right. just for a pars from a parsing perspective if anybody else ever has to deal with that markup. And then I think Panelizer has gone pretty far with IPE and Panelizer. Um, obviously that doesn't get stored back into the body, which can be good and bad. Um, but I think you know having that kind of functionality, we could bring some of those components over and just kind of apply that to the body instead of just applying it to. With the idea of having you little widgets that you can kind of pull into the body. Yeah, and, and I think like the the framework that CK Editor gives us um, in CK Editor four and Drupal eight especially, where the configuration is a lot more a lot more cleanly um, integrated. Um, CK Editor is like widgets system that allows you to have sort of a self-contained chunk inside of the WYSIWYG editor that gets its own code for manipulation and, you know, can have its own helper dialogues and stuff like that. I think that is, has the potential to be a really big tool in this for us to sort of like sandbox a kind of complexity behind an embed tag or a very short specialized piece of structure and then give people a useful interface to manipulate that. That kind of leads into my question, uh, you know, do you really think WYSIWYGs are up to this? Because in my experience, even anything above the, even the most simple things, lists and tables, they still muck that stuff up. Do you really think they're up to this kind of complexity? That I think they're from? more up to this than they are reproducing the functionality of Dreamweaver. Um, you know, it, it's... I think there was a, just an article um, that went up on Medium. Uh, Medium.com has an amazingly, like, just super streamlined, ultra-minimalist 
inline WYSIWYG editor. If you have permission to edit a document, you can just click in it and start typing and select text and format it. There's no barrier between the concept of a thing you're viewing and a thing you're editing if you have permission. Um, and the lead engineer on their WYSIWYG editor just wrote this long tirade on how incredibly horrifyingly terrible the content editable interface, you know, in the HTML spec is and what that just the whole idea is broken and all the stuff that has to be worked around. I mean, writing a useful WYSIWYG editor that lives in the browser is a non-trivial task, and I would never wish it on anyone that I, I mean, God bless the CK team. Well, that's what I'm looking at. So you, in your opinion, CK editor is the best tool if we wanted to try and implement some of what you're talking about. I personally think, think so. Having talked with the CK team, their thinking is very much in line with this stuff in terms of like capturing meaning wherever possible, presenting a useful editing interface for that meaning, and then transforming on output. They're definitely uh, on board with that concept, and they've built APIs to support that kind of stuff in their plugin architecture. Okay, thank you. Not a question. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha Crafty. Yes. I work in a data shop, actually. Woo! I know. And we have a, a tool that we use for the data editors called Oxygen XML. And um, which has an author mode, which is a you know a GUI mode, and um, and our authors are you know electrical engineers. They're subject matter experts. Yes, not CMS experts. But you would think that they would appreciate structure. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that content authors appreciate structure. Right. It's, because the, the stuff that they design is modular, right? They have a piece of digital logic that does this. I'm going to hook it up with this, and it sits inside. But they fight tooth and nail because they just want to write yeah. like a word processor. But no one downstream can benefit if it's just words and yeah. paragraphs. So we've had to get sneaky with them by using all kinds of things like Schematron and X path, so you can say it looks at the content and says if what they've done so far, right, matches this pattern, then offer up these things as content completion wizards, like you have in a code editor. It looks like you're writing installation <laughs> instructions, <laughs> <laughs> but it's under the underneath, underneath it's structured. Yes, but to and you it looks. It looks. <laughs> it looks like you're trying to write installation instructions. I have falsetto too. Yeah. It's about as close as I can get to an anthropomorphic yeah. paperclip, but yeah. So it's it's um, it's how to keep structure while not um, encumbering them with the structure. Yeah. And like the idea of a WYSIWYG editor where you use buttons to do this—that is currently the predominant mechanism for capturing meaning. And I think that. That kind of stuff, if there are predictable enough things that you can recognize, that's a really, really cool approach to it. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're storing structure that captures meaning. Right. Even if from their experience, it's just, well, I started writing this thing, and, and oh, okay, cool, it was helpful for me. You know, that, that's right. the ideal case. But we also can't just magically do that until we figure out what the structures right. are that they're going to be inputting and what we want the destinations to be. Wait I, a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to follow This is just turning into a bath. Yeah. <laughs> it's a core conversation. <laughs> That's fair. Um, and you did say that everyone can go to beer if they want to, right? It's true. So, okay. so I don't know what you people are doing here. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to follow up on the, on the sort of WYSIWYG CK editor question and, and answer there is, uh, you know, Drup the, the history of Drupal 8 development has been a lot about, you know, how can Drupal collaborate with other projects, you mm -hmm. know, and we've heard a lot about that. We've, you know, done some great work in terms of the collaboration between Drupal and Symfony. But another area where that's happened is between Drupal 8 and CK Editor. So yeah. the process, you know, we've been wanting a WYSIWYG editor in Drupal core for years. But they but were also terrible. They were also terrible. And in the process of trying to get into Drupal 8, you know, like uh, CK Editor did a great job in, in their, you know, early releases of version 4. And then since they released 4.0 to now, where I think they're on 4.4 or 4.5 or something yeah. like that, 
that's, that's involved like over a year, maybe a year to two years of really close collaboration between the CK team and a lot of Drupal developers. And w so. one of the things that we actually talked about in Prague, which I think would just be the craziest thing ever, is CK Editor even has like um, the kind of stuff that you would normally say, oh, well, when somebody pastes HTML from Microsoft Word and, you know, we, we want to scrub it into something clean, well, they've abstracted that step into a separate component of the CK Editor framework, so you could do things like paste markdown in, and it turns it into whatever you want the underlying markup to be. Or say you could write a plugin that recognizes you are pasting a YouTube embed code and turns it into a media module embed code. Stuff like that is all possible, and that's that idea of like providing the assistive layer on top of the underlying structure. Yeah, so I just I think it's a really great example of like you were mentioning, you know, like the the, the, the Diddy people have figured out all sorts of interesting stuff, but yes. meanwhile we in Drupal have figured out all sorts of interesting stuff and wouldn't it be cool to collaborate and seek editor Seek editor is an example where that's happened, where the CK yeah. team has been into the WYSIWYG world and figuring out how do you put a WYSIWYG editing into a browser and spend ten years, you know, figuring that out. Meanwhile in Drupal we've done a lot of thinking on content structuring. So yep. the last two years of the two teams actually working together to create a WYSIWYG editor that supports content structuring has really paid off. Yeah, I mean, as, as a WYSIWYG skeptic for a long, long time, um, I, I, learning more and more about that and getting, and, and at least watching some of those conversations unfold has been really encouraging, because like, the CK team in particular is really on board with the idea of building an assistive editor in the browser rather than, you know, a Dreamweaver box, and that makes me happy.